a, uh, a, a small panel to discuss some of these issues in a little bit greater depth. Um, pleased to welcome uh, Dr. Keith Payne and Frank Miller, uh, two household names in the nuclear world. Uh, Keith, of course, professor and head of the Department of Defense and Strategic Studies uh, for Missouri State University, president of National Institute for Public Policy, and former uh, deputy assistant secretary for Forces Policy. Uh, Frank Miller, non-resident senior advisor uh, here at CSIS, principal of the Scowcroft Group, and of course has held a number of very senior positions in shaping U.S. and allied nuclear policy and programs. Um, we're going to go with Keith first, uh, okay. then Frank, and then I'm actually going to, I'll talk as well. Go ahead. Okay, good, thanks. Uh, thank you, Tom, and uh, thanks to C uh, CSIS for co hosting this event and for Stratcom for uh, providing the main featured speaker. It was wonderful. Um, I've been uh, asked to talk a bit about uh, the Russian Federation and where the Russian Federation appears to be heading with regard to nuclear weapons, its theories of deterrence, and, and so forth. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and do that. Obviously, that's not to suggest that Russia is the only concern. There are many concerns, but we're trying to keep this short, so with seven or eight minutes, I'm not going to try and do uh, more than that. And in fact, the presentation I'll give here, I've derived from a presentation I gave yesterday. So for those of you who are at the SW21 conference yesterday, you won't hear much new, at least from me. I'm sure you'll hear many things new from Frank uh, and Tom. Let me start out just by noting that uh, President Putin's worldview is evident in his statement that the collapse of the Soviet Union was the greatest catastrophe of the 20th century. Uh, he views the West as the culprit for that collapse. Uh, and he has a, and a threat to his grand strategic vision, the vision that he has for Russia. That vision includes the reestablishment of Russian dominance in the near abroad uh, via Russification of areas and the use of multiple instruments of power, uh, including military, diplomatic, economic, and indeed information warfare. That worldview and grand strategy, I believe, are highly revisionist, they're confrontational, and they're actionable. Uh, the evidence is clear, for example, that Russia's 2008 military operation against Georgia was not improvised, and neither are Russian operations in Ukraine. Uh, these were planned military actions that are reflective of a grand strategy uh, to reestablish Russia's dominance at the expense of neighbors by force if needed, if not by preference. Uh, Russia is rebuilding its conventional forces, which, while no match for the collective might of NATO, are superior to each of its neighbors, except for China. And accordingly, Moscow seeks to prevent any significant Western collective response or opposition by threatening limited nuclear first use. When I say that, please note that this is not the Cold War notion of an essentially defensive mutual balance of terror. It is a new coercive use of nuclear weapons and nuclear threats. And if Russian planning now follows this declared strategy, its expressions on this matter, if Russian planning actually follows this declared strategy, and I have no reason to believe that it does not, uh, it tells me that U.S. and NATO deterrence policy is now failing in a fundamental way. And the consequences of that failure could be catastrophic. This Russian strategy includes many provocations and direct nuclear threats to U.S. allies and partners, as, as Admiral Haney noted earlier. Uh, correspondingly and accordingly, um, Russia is pursuing specialized, according to open sources, open Russian sources, Russia is pursuing specialized low-yield nuclear weapons to make first-use threats credible and its weapons locally employable. Very low-yield weapons, Russian officials have argued, could be a critical component for Russian nuclear strategy because very low-yield nuclear warheads, and I quote, can be realistic utilized, realistically utilized in the event of large-scale military conflict involving the use of conventional arms, use of low-yield nuclear weapons in the context of conventional armed warfare. These types of capabilities, I should add, are not inherently destabilizing, I don't believe, but they are likely to be so when combined with and in support of Russia's expansionist foreign policy agenda and a strategy of nuclear coercion. 
and Russian, Russian military officials speak openly of the preemptive employment, employment of nuclear weapons in conventional war. In short, Russia's approach to nuclear policy is not a defensive deterrent as we tend to know it in the West. Uh, instead, Russia uses coercive first use nuclear threats to provide cover for military actions against neighbors that destroy the post-war, post-Cold War settlement, including revision of established borders. Russia apparently put its nuclear forces on alert in 2008 during its operations against Georgia, and President Putin has said openly that he considered doing so again in 2014. That's the new reality. Uh, I don't suggest that this is Cold War Part Two. Uh, in fact, in some ways, I think it is more dangerous than the Cold War. Now, part of this new reality is Moscow's sophisticated propaganda effort aimed at domestic and international audiences. These propaganda efforts vilify the U.S. and NATO with what I only describe as a repetition of big lies. Uh, for example, the new Russian national security strategy just released claims that the U.S and the European Union caused the Ukrainian crisis. It's in Article 17 uh, that the U.S. and the EU foment color revolutions and destroy traditional Russian religious and moral values. That's Article 43. And also that the U.S. and NATO are pursuing, quote, multifarious and interconnected threats to Russian national security. Let's take a look. It's in Article 12. Russian defense expert and former senior Duma member Alexei Arbatov has observed that Russian defense and foreign policies are based on a series of consensus beliefs in Moscow. They include the following. One, Russia is surrounded by enemies led by the United States. Two, the U.S. is using the pro-democracy opposition inside Russia to subvert the Putin regime. Three, the U.S. with its allies may invade Russia anytime, and the West plans to use military power to seize Russian natural riches, and five nuclear weapons are the cornerstone of Russian national security, while calls for nuclear disarmament are a malicious U.S. swindle. These views may sound odd to you. They sound like they come from an alternate universe to me. Uh, but according to Arbatov, these are consensus positions. These are known knowns in Moscow. And I think this self-induced paranoia, as described by Russian journalist Alexander Goltz recently, is extremely dangerous and destabilizing stuff. Russia's grand strategy also includes across the board nuclear modernization programs, most of which predate the Obama administration's fledgling nuclear modernization and recapitalization programs and also maintenance of an enormous tactical nuclear arsenal. In addition, since 2014, there reportedly, reportedly has been a dramatic new Russian emphasis on passive preparations for nuclear war, uh, more than has been seen since the Soviet times. Again, there's nothing inherently destabilizing about offensive or defensive preparations, but when done in conjunction with an expansionist foreign policy a revisionist agenda, and a strategy of nuclear coercion, they are likely to be so. Now, nevertheless, uh, U.S. perceptions remain divided with regard to Russian intentions and the appropriate U.S. response policies at this point. Uh, some fear that a robust U.S. response would provoke Russia further. Others fear that the absence of a robust U.S. response will provoke Russia further. There, these, at least these two opinions and some in between. But one narrative, for example, is that recent Russian military operations are, quote, not worth a lot of worry. Uh, that the portrayal of Vladimir Putin as a grand chess master is laughable. And that instead of struggling to cobble together a response to Russian hybrid warfare, NATO should do very little in response. In contrast, senior U.S. civilian and military leaders have recently identified Russia as a serious threat, including Russia's apparent nuclear first use regional strategy. For example, Secretary of Defense Carter has described Russia, and I quote, as a very, very significant threat, and quote, an antagonist. The key question that comes from these points is, how should the West 
address these emerging realities, and I think they are the emerging realities. Uh, I believe that I'm going to leave it at that, and I believe that Frank Miller is going to, and Tom Carrico will offer some suggestions on how we might respond to what the post-Cold War realities now are. Well, again, let me add my thanks to the to CSIS for being included here and for joining my friends on this morning's session. Let me pick up where Keith left off. He described in stark terms the fact that Russia, despite our best efforts, again poses a major threat to the United States and our allies. The combination of Putin's messianic and paranoid worldview, the capabilities of the newly rebuilt Russian army, and the advantages of geography which it, which it enjoys, the major buildup in Russian nuclear forces, the Russian snap exercises which could form the basis of a major surprise, the nuclear saber rattling and attempted nuclear blackmail all paint a fairly unsettling scene. And given, of all, given all of this, it, it, is, it is past time for us to decide how we are going to respond. I was very pleased to hear Admiral Haney's remarks because he is beginning to break away from the current response because the current response, which is ignore the threat and hope it goes away, is dangerous. We always have to remember that the appearance of weakness is provocative. And regrettably, our policy, apart from stating that, quote, as long as nuclear weapons exist, the United States will maintain a safe, secure, and reliable deterrent, close quote, has not yet recognized the threats posed by the developments Keith has just described. And to use an historical example, to the extent that our unwillingness to respond is perceived by the Russian leadership as weakness, much as Hitler perceived the failure of Britain and France to respond to his reoccupation of the Rhineland and his annexations of Austria and Czechoslovakia as proof that Britain and France would not defend Poland. If that point continues, then we have left the door open to potential miscalculations by Mr. Putin and his gang, miscalculations which could prove deadly in a crisis. So there are four distinct areas where we and here I use we to mean both the United States and our NATO allies, can and must do better. Step one is to recognize that the threat exists. We must understand and take seriously that Putin's policies, his pronouncements, and investments in nuclear forces suggest he may believe that military use of those weapons in a crisis is feasible. It is, therefore, incumbent upon us to decide that we need to convince him, however he has chosen to demonize us and mischaracterize our intentions, it is imperative that we convince him that using nuclear weapons to achieve military advantage will not work to Russia's success. Having taken a decision to respond, the second step is to engage the public. In democracies, our democracy and our allies' democracies, public understanding is vital if there is to be popular support for government policies. But how can publics understand if governments remain silent? I'm not aware of any official U.S. government or NATO document which sets forth what the Russian Federation has been saying and doing with respect to its nuclear forces over the past decade, or one which explains in detail why the United States and the Alliance require a nuclear deterrent. NATO has not even refuted the line in public taken up by Putin and his henchmen that the modernization of the B-61 bomb, a weapon designed in the 1960s and which in its current configuration still uses vacuum tubes. Putin claims that changes the military balance in Europe and is a violation of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Of course, the Russian charges are blatant lies. 
The presence of U.S. nuclear forces in Europe and the role of allied delivery systems in conjunction with U.S. custodial teams was explicitly recognized by the USSR in the NPT negotiations. If you don't believe me, look it up and look what Secretary Rusk said to the Senate as he presented the NPT um, in, in the 60s. And the one-for-one -one replacement of current bombs to replace antiquated electronics with modern ones does not alter the existing military balance at all. So it's time for all 28 member governments of NATO, including the United States government, to engage on this. And in the near term, the upcoming July 2016 Warsaw Summit should produce an explanation of why NATO needs a nuclear deterrent, and governments should engage with their publics on that. So that's step two. Step three, the third step is to modify our declaratory policy. We must make sure, we must make clear that any use of a nuclear weapon by the Russian Federation, including one intended, quote, only to produce electro electromagnetic pulse, close quote, or anything that begins to implement the announced Russian escalate to de-escalate strategy, any use of a nuclear weapon, opens the door to a world of, enor of enormous uncertainty, one potential result of which might be the destruction, the utter destruction of Russia as Putin knows and cherishes it. We know in this country that there are no winners in a nuclear war. But for deterrence to be effective, we and NATO must convince Mr. Putin of this, because that is the way to prevent miscalculation, aggression, and war. So what we say about all of this must change. And there are adequate models to draw on from the past. For example, quote, we for our part are under no illusions about the consequences of a nuclear war. We believe there would be no winners in such a war. But the recognition of this on our part is not sufficient to assure effective deterrence or to prevent the outbreak of war. It's essential that the Soviet leadership understands this as well. We must make certain that the Soviet leadership in calculating the risks of aggression recognizes that because of our retaliatory capability, there can be no circumstance where the initiation of nuclear war at any level or of any duration would make sense. That language is used decades ago by former Secretary of Defense Caspar Weinberger. Or this from Harold Brown. Quote, our strategy makes clear that no course of aggression by them, the Soviets, that led to the use of nuclear weapons on any scale and at any stage of conflict could lead to a victory, however they define victory. Statements such as these have not been made by senior U.S. officials for several decades, probably as far back as 1993. And it's time to bring something like that back to make clear that attacking us or our allies with nuclear weapons will bring a response which will cause the aggressor to suffer losses which far outweigh any gains he might hope to achieve. And the fourth step, the fourth step, recognize the threat, engage publics, change declaratory, declaratory policy. The fourth step is to modernize our deterrent forces. We must build up our conventional forces in NATO and U.S. forces in Europe. That can be on a rotating basis, as Secretary Carter is doing, or we can increase our permanent deployments there. Secretary Carter has been leading in this area, as has General Breedlove. But this is absolutely critical. And as Admiral, as Admiral Haney indicated, triad modernization occurs on a roughly 20-year cycle, first in the 60s, then in the 80s. So we're at least a decade behind. We must now carry through on our promises to use our precious tax dollars to rebuild and modernize our strategic deterrent forces, because those forces are aging, and because Moscow and Beijing are embarked upon the massive buildups in their own nuclear missile programs. If we fail to modernize our forces, as the Admiral said, our determination to protect ourselves and our allies from nuclear threats and intimidation will be called into question. Today, the bomber and ICBM legs of our triad have significant deficiencies. And yet the modernization programs for all three legs of the triad remain in the planning stages with new systems not expected to be in the field until the, mid to late 19, until the mid to late 2020s. Worse yet, the arms control community, despite the deal it struck in 2010 to support triad modernization in exchange for ratification of New START, 
The arms control community continues to call for slashing the modernization programs, eliminating the replacement for the air-launched cruise missile, thereby taking the B-52 out of the triad and eviscerating the air leg of that force. They call for eliminating the replacement of the Minuteman ICBM, canceling the B-61 modernization program, thereby ending NATO's forward-based deterrent and therefore its risk-sharing and burden-sharing policies. And finally, if that, that's not enough, cutting back significantly the number of SSBNs, which in the aggregate will carry upwards of 70% of our deterrent under New START. We must resist such siren calls. At the end of the day, the credibility of our deterrent rests on a potential enemy leadership, recognizing that our forces pose a threat of unacceptable retaliation in response to aggression. An obsolescing force provides a questionable deterrent. A modernized force provides a credible one. And despite the loose talk one always hears in this town, we can easily sustain modernization. To the question that was posed to Admiral Haney earlier, there's a 2015 CSBA, Center for Strategic and Budgetary Affairs study written by Todd Harrison, now proudly a member of the staff here at CSIS, which demonstrates that the Strategic Force Modernization Program is affordable and would consume on average 5%, 5% of our defense budget over the next 20 years. All of that said, we should take full advantage of opportunities which exist within those programs to make savings, and two come to mind. First, there is a great opportunity to pursue what the head of the Navy Strategic Systems Office, Vice Admiral Terry Benedict, calls intelligent commonality. This approach would see the Navy and Air Force programs to build follow-on systems to Trident II and Minuteman III using c common components where these can be found in both missiles rather than having each program proceed completely independently. In light of budgetary pressures and a shrinking industrial and tech base, intelligent commonality offers major benefits for each service and for the DOD top line. And if the Navy and the Air Force and their respective contractor teams can find ways to maximize commonality to reduce risk, to reduce cost, and to accelerate fielding of both a follow-on to Triton and a follow-on to Minuteman, that would be a huge win for the United States. Similarly, intelligent use of multi-year procurement will allow DOD to save literally hundreds of millions of dollars, I say it again, hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions, specifically on projects like the Ohio SSBN replacement. As far as NATO is concerned, the alliance must ensure that its nuclear forces are capable and seen by the Russian leadership and the Russian military as being capable of carrying out their mission. And this means more and more realistic exercises, improving the ability of shape to engage in realistic planning, modernizing NATO's dual capable aircraft over time, increasing the survivability of the existing dual capable aircraft force today and completing the B-61 modernization program. There's much to be done and I would hope that NATO at the Warsaw Summit will lend support to improving planning and forces. And finally, in closing, let me also assert my firm belief that we need to improve dramatically our scholarship and intelligence on Russian thinking on nuclear weapons. Deterrence depends fundamentally on understanding an opponent's thinking and influencing it. Our knowledge of Russian nuclear policy has declined over the past several decades as resources were shifted to other more seemingly pressing near-term subjects. It's past time to rejuvenate our ability to understand Russian nuclear policy and developments. Thank you very much. So I, we've started from very broad, and I'm going to move down to very narrow. Uh, I wanted to address uh, one specific topic uh, within the air-breathing leg of the triad, uh, which we discussed earlier with Admiral Haney, and that is uh, the long-range standoff missile, or LRSO. I do this in part because it's generated a lot of attention in the last several months. A lot of pieces have been written on it. Um, most of those have been uh, in opposition calling for its cancellation, uh, or at least delay, and at least questioning its utility. And I think overall, this, this is a vigorous discussion, has been a, a good one, 
in part for reminding us what, and, and forcing us to think again about why we have various capabilities, why we have a triad, and, and that sort of thing. Um, I happen to believe uh, that a standoff cruise missile represents an especially important component of both our current and future uh, nuclear deterrent. In fact, I don't think it's a close question. The, cur the only current nuclear cruise missile, of course, is the AGM-86B Alcom, carried, above, uh, carried aboard B-52s. Uh, it was first deployed in 1982 with a planned service life of 10 years. It is, everybody uh, concedes, it is insufficiently stealthy for modern air defenses, and its reliability continues to decline. That's a nice way of saying it's really old and pretty unreliable. I don't think I'd want to drive a 1982 car home in today's storm, to pick up on Haney's analogy from earlier. Uh, I'm going to commend a couple uh, anti-LRSO pieces uh, along the way here. Um, if you've not read it, I, I would commend a recent defense news piece uh, from about a week ago uh, for collecting a number of quotes about the remarkable extent to which the reliability of Alcom has gone down and how the LRSO uh, would improve upon it, uh, improve in terms of its, I'll say, characteristics rather than adding new capability. Uh, the nuclear cruise missile is the weapon most commonly associated with extended deterrence across the Asia-Pacific and the tyranny of distance of, of Asia-Pacific. Uh, when the nuclear tomahawk was retired, uh, our, some of our allies in the region were reassured in part, especially because of the U.S. capability to have this air-launched cruise missile. But of course, it's not merely about a particular, one particular region. Uh, a, a sensible capabilities-based approach uh, has, has uh, applicability globally, especially in an uncertain, uncertain strategic environment, as we heard about this morning. Now, we've been going around and collecting the various arguments against LRSO, and there's over a dozen, somewhere between a dozen and 20, and I want to walk through a couple of them uh, this morning. Uh, some of them appear to be stemming from a belief in the, just the relative undesirability of either nuclear cruise missiles uh, or cruise missiles per se. Uh, some, for instance, have argued that uh, the example of a Russian uh, caliber falling into Iran is an instance that nuclear cruise missiles are inherently unreliable. Uh, others have suggested that, I, I guess because they're smaller than an ICBM, they're more likely to get stolen or lost or picked up by a non-state actor. But of course, as they apply to U.S. forces, certainly, uh, nuclear weapons are nuclear weapons. Uh, and cruise missile technology, furthermore, has come a long way <coughs> since the days of Regulus or snark-infested waters. So s some of these I, I don't put as much uh, emphasis on. Let me focus on a, on a handful of others. First of all, the suggestion that the Nuclear Posture Review of 2010, which suggested, uh, which had the phrase, no new capabilities, should preclude this, uh, this aspect of modernization. And I think this is, unfortunately, a, a misreading of that section of the NPR. Uh, if you take a look at that quote, it talks about life extension programs. That's the subject of that sentence. Uh, and that life extension programs will not, uh, will not be new warhead designs nor support new, new weapon capabilities. Uh, it doesn't say that we won't have new characteristics or improved characteristics for our delivery platforms. If we did, we should probably question getting a B-3 bomber that's better than what we have today, for instance. Uh, furthermore, uh, this is, I think, not only uh, not inconsistent, but pursuant to uh, the NPR, and as much as the NPR emphasized the importance to retain sufficient force structure to shift between the, the three legs of the triad. Uh, if we don't have any air-launched cruise missile on the bomber <coughs> leg, uh, you're going to have a harder time shifting to that for either technical or geopolitical reasons. Uh, this is, I think, why Frank Kendall, in that quote I, ha I spoke earlier, uh, that the absence of it would be a, a symbol of, a, of, of decline rather than a bellwether of strength. Uh, this administration's signature arms control agreement, New START, specifically builds in this flexibility, this hedge, uh, under the discount rule. And don't take my word for it, uh, but Under Secretary Rose Gottmuller, in an interview for Arms Control Today last year, uh, uh, emphasized this point uh, in the context of a question about LRSO, said it is not about new capabilities. That's one argument. Another argument is that uh, it's redundant because we have an air-breathing leg that uh, is capable of delivering gravity bombs, and after all, we're doing the B-6112 uh, LEP. Uh, this, is a, this is a big gamble, perhaps the biggest gamble, uh, a bet that the uh, upcoming, not yet built, LRSB 
stealth characteristics will be able to defeat future air defenses perhaps forever. Uh, and that even if it could, that that alone would be adequate. Uh, after all, a bomber with gravity bombs alone has to fly over each target one at a time, making air defense easier for an adversary and increasing risk not only to the bomber and the pilot, but also to the tanker and other associated fighter or uh, command and control aircraft that might be around. The capability, the, 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 the characteristic rather of cruise missiles uh, circuitous paths uh, is a pretty uh, important one, as well as the ability to come from multi uh, directions simultaneously and therefore to achieve some synchronization or simultaneity. Uh, doing this, allowing not merely the bomber, but even smaller, even lower observable uh, delivery vehicles, cruise missiles, to do so is a, is a cost imposing strategy uh, on adversaries uh, and not one that ought to be uh, discounted. In other words, I think the argument for standoff really is uh, incontrovertible. So let me move to another, um, I think, commendable anti-LRSO argument that is out there. And that is that we can do all these uh, missions that the LRSO is designed for with conventional cruise missiles. Um, I commend uh, my friend Hans Christensen for making this argument, uh, I think, a couple months ago. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, he identifies the JASM or the JASM ER in particular as being able to, uh, to do this. Uh, there is, of course, some overlap, but there are different missions and different characteristics here. Uh, not the least of which is that that's not designed to operate in the, the nuclear environment. I would also point out that even the JASM ER is significantly less range than even today's Alcom. It cannot reach nearly so far as even today's potential. And of course, uh, you also raise the question that a conventional, although precision guidance has, precision guidance has advanced considerably, cannot do all the, the things that a nuclear, either EMP or other blast can do from the suppression of air defenses to hitting mobile or at least uncertainly uh, located uh, targets. Cost is another one. Uh, this has been uh, already alluded to earlier, and I will cite again Todd Harrison's CSBA report uh, from this past fall, and he identified there, and he and his colleague uh, Evan Montgomery identified that if you were to cancel LRSO, you would have a grand total of $14.7 billion savings between FY15 and FY39. Um, again, I think the, the bigger picture of here of are we going to follow through with the uh, capabilities and requirements that were post NPR reconsidered in the 2013 employment guidance? And if so, and if uh, the nuclear mission is indeed the highest priority, then we ought to be able to afford it. Another argument, destabilizing because dual use, uh, that uh, an adversary, if we are in such, such dire circumstances as to be using this, employing this rather, uh, that would not know uh, as it sees it coming whether it was conventional or nuclear. Of course, the United States has used cruise missiles, including ALCOMs and CALCOMs, uh, conventional, uh, in a number of conflicts, hundreds of them thus far, uh, and we have, have so far managed this uh, admittedly uh, potential uh, problem. Uh, I would also add to this, however, that the whole point of a stealthy cruise missile is that you don't see it coming. And the, the, the point that it would probably not be seen, or hopefully not be seen until it arrived on target. Um, another argument is that, that the United States, by taking the lead and, and unilaterally canceling the LRSO, would inspire arms control, uh, or excuse me, inspire others to do the same, perhaps uh, following suit with uh, a global ban, either on nuclear cruise missiles, which has verification problems, or perhaps cruise missiles uh, altogether. I would note, however, that even stipulating that, that would be a worthy and achievable goal, it, it would be an odd thing to do it unilaterally, thereby giving up a bargaining chip or leverage to get others uh, to do the same. Pakistan, China, Russia, North Korea, uh, I, I suspect that they will not be so impressed by our unilateral elimination, and neither, by the way, may some of our allies, such as Japan or South Korea. Another argument is that we should consult, we should pause, delay the program, and consult with our allies uh, and see if perhaps uh, the, this new program, this new alleged new capability would be seen by them as destabilizing. 
Um, I think actually that the situation is rather, we've been consulting with our allies all along, and there is some uh, appetite for it. Uh, let me bring this to a close by, by coming back to uh, one of the more frequently uh, raised arguments, and that is the Prague Agenda. The Prague Agenda, the NPR, uh, did not merely consist of the wish for global zero and the desire to get there as quickly as possible e through unilateral action. On the contrary, of course, it, it was uh, the effort to sustain nuclear deterrence for the indefinite future for as long as nuclear weapons existed, and this included this modernization effort. The New START resolution of ratification by the Senate specifically called out and required the President to certify his intention to have a re uh, replacement or life extension for the outcome. Uh, so a, uh, I would say a pre precipitous or premature reduction in U.S. capabilities and posture would further fail to strengthen deterrence, another key goal of the, uh, of the NPR, and by weakening extended deterrence, threaten to undermine what the NPR identified as its top priority, namely nonproliferation. I'll quote again the Frank Kendall that without LRSO's advanced standoff capability, the bomber leg of the triad will gradually become a symbol of our decline rather than a bellwether of enduring American strength. That's an, an important statement, especially because it assumes, it assumes a stealthy uh, bomber, a new bomber. So to wrap up, my argument is one of constancy and for defending the administration's, the Obama administration's current path. Irrespective of differences about the near or medium term desirability or possibility of global zero, there's been a remarkable bipartisan consensus about the path forward on modernization. Cruise missiles provide unique characteristics for nuclear deterrence, including capabilities critical to flexibility and credibility for our current environment. The Obama administration has laid out a prudent, balanced path for nuclear modernization. An outcome replacement is a vital component of that program, and we should continue to follow the path the administration is on. Thank you. So I'm going to pull double duty and, and moderate questions as well as uh, uh, talk. But I, before we open it up to the audience, I want to see if either of you gentlemen have any comments between each other. No, let's go. Okay. So let's op open it up. Mr. Lutz. Hi, Chuck Lutz, uh, National Defense University. I actually have two questions. Um, Frank, uh, you mentioned the need, and Keith, I've heard you talk about this before as well, the need to educate the American public, other capitals, about the threat and about the imperative of the strategic deterrence mission. But yet, when you look at the discussion or the debates within the presidential com campaigns on both sides, Democratic and Republican, uh, there's been very little discussion of this. And yet, when there has been, it's been, to use a phrase of one of the candidates, a horror show. Uh, so why has the message not resonated? And how, what do we do about that? How do we, how do we get that message uh, out? The second question is about strategic force modernization. Um, would you agree that, in some ways, we're just recapitalizing the current force posture? Uh, and are, is that the right set of capabilities needed in the future for what we have just described as being a changed or changing uh, set of threats? Well, if you think you're going to get me to comment on candidates and debates, you're not. Um, <laughs> but I'll go back to the basic point. There's nothing out, the only, the only publication I'm aware of that's, that's out in the, in the community that describes Russian and Chinese and North Korean building programs and Russian exercises and Russian statements from their most senior officials was something that Keith published. It's the only document, which is kind of a stunning statement. Um, and because it uh, has gotten um, limited distribution at best, there's an enormous amount of ignorance on the topic. And it's a topic that people don't really want to, want to, want to turn to anyway. You know, Cold War's over. Um, new start with Russia is all supposed to be uh, uh, getting away from these kinds of, of, of issues. So 
again, unless the government puts some effort behind publicizing threats to America, um, then, then more broadly, people will not know about it. Again, I, I think that NATO at the, at the summit ought to do something uh, uh, about that. Um, you know, is the force structure the same as before? Yeah, it's the same as before in many ways. Um, could there be some things that we might do t to address credibility in the eyes of the Russians, as Keith was pointing out? Uh, perhaps, but those have been blocked by the Congress uh, because of the belief that any, any modifications of the, of the warheads uh, constitute new and dangerous military capabilities, regardless of what others are doing, with, which are not seen by them as dangerous military capabilities. So uh, the triad has been, has been decried and attacked for decades, but it survives because it actually does, does meet a national requirement. Um, yeah, I'd like to see a little bit more flexibility on the, on the warhead side. Not massively, but, but you know, some flexibility. Now, I don't have anything to add to Frank's point on the, on the force structure, but let me hey, add something. Could you identify this, this publication that he mentioned? I'm sorry? No, it's called no, Foreign Nuclear Developments. Uh, it's a, it's a, Is it available on your website? It's available on the website if you'd like to see it. It's based on all open sources, including a large number of foreign sources. And, and just to, to, to shill for you, you've also got a new publication coming out. Yeah, we had uh, a new publication that uh, just came out last week. Uh, it's uh, called The Russian Strategy. Uh, it's, uh, again, uh, this is a much more comprehensive, detailed monograph, which uh, either for good or ill has 700 references to Russian documents, open Russian documents to be Russian sourced, so you can understand where the information came from. Uh, but with those, let me just comment, Chuck, because it's a great question. Uh, why hasn't the message resonated? Uh, one of the points Frank made, and that's because there's been very little message. I mean, outside of very narrow circles, there's been no message. Y'all, a uh, number of you in the room are old enough, as I am, to remember Soviet military power uh, put out annually by DOD. Now, whether you liked that document or you didn't like that <coughs> document and how it was done, I mean, it was an effort to try and let folks know what was going on, what were the realities. Um, there's just not much of that that's gone on, and I'm not criticizing anyone for that, for that, um, for that lapse right now. But one of the reasons for that, I believe, is because it's really, it's a really hard message. I mean, if you look at the post-Cold War order, what did we expect? I mean, go back and look at what we were talking about had happened in the post-Cold War period. Cold War is over. The Soviet Union was essentially gone. History was over. Uh, we had a new world order that was benign uh, and happy. I mean, that's an awfully lovely message. Really hard to decide, you know, we probably got that wrong. And so it's a combination of very little message, a very hard message to say, you know, most of what the Western capitals have thought about the post-Cold War order uh, is now demonstrably wrong, and we have to rethink things. It's a hard message. Linton Brooks. Yeah, Linton Brooks, uh, CSIS, and some other places. Um, <laughs> these are comments masquerading as questions, so assume that at the end there is a, what do you think of that? Um, I agree with everything everybody said. But I want to point out a couple of dangers we haven't gotten to. First, everything Frank said about Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin is A, much milder than he's been in other fora, and B, true. But I think there's a real danger in personalizing this exclusively to Putin. Putin has created a system of Putinism. His replacement will not be trading up. And the reason that's important is that we lack the ability to make the modernization program different than something that comes to fruition in 15 years. So it's irrelevant except in this touchy-feely show resolve to Putin. Okay, maybe. Um, I'll believe Vladimir is going to adhere to the Russian 
Constitution and step down um, when I see it. But in any event, Putin may very well be gone by the time the first modernized thing appears, but Putinism will not. So I think that we want to be very careful not to over-personalize this, point one. Point two, um, there was an excellent defense LRSO. I, I sort of wish somebody in the federal government would do that. Uh, but I would add one more concern, not because I like it, but because of who's making it. And that is the destabilizing argument because exactly what you said, you won't know what's coming. And the reason that's important is that in the Bill Perry and Andy Weber argument, uh, a Andy's views are probably not going to capture the attention, but Bill Perry's tend to. And I think that we, we need to have that. And then finally, I, I think that Frank point about the message is absolutely right. We are allowing a series of self-inflicted wounds to go unanswered. All right. It shows that the United States is out to get Russia because we're continuing European phased adaptive approach even though we have the Iranian deal. Completely unanswered by the United States government. Oh, by the way, there was a time when, when the President of the United States was called a liar. The United States thought that was important enough to comment on. That time apparently has passed, because that's exactly the quote. The Americans have lied to us. Um, and so it seems to me that we need to engender a little bit more, not of answering every nut, but of answering every nut that seems to be capturing. For example, Frank and I both can bend your ears until the snow actually starts about why eight SSBNs is a bad idea, even if it will carry the same number of warheads. Seen anything in the public domain yet about that? Might be useful. And so I guess I would urge to look much more broadly at the number of self-inflicted wounds that we are allowing by not answering things. If the rules require that there be a question, it's what do you think of that? <laughs> if, I, if, if I don't answer, does it imply that I agree? <laughs> I, you know, I, I think you're right. Uh, Putin is a particularly m malevolent individual. Um, when you take a look across the board, uh, not only as, as to the, the you know more than the well, if you look at the assassinations at home and abroad, the destruction of the free press, the destruction of the Russian democratic system, um, the uh, the bilking of millions, uh, the the cronyism, uh, the regime is a is is a totalitarian regime. It doesn't have the communist ideology, but it has an aggressive nationalist, uh, religious uh, um, ideology which, which it has propagated and expanded. Um, I think the Russians believe that if we don't answer that, you know, we're, we are cowed by all of this. Uh, I'm not a pop psychologist, but I think you're right. We do need to look at the, at the, at the inner circle because, God help us, he may be the best of the inner circle. In fact, uh, let me just add on to the, your point and, and Frank's point that it's not personalized to Putin. The, and the it that I'm referring to is the type of strategy developments that, that we've been talking about here this morning, is if you see when this started emerging in the Russian printed material, it goes back to 1999. Uh, and it's been uh, maturing uh, since then. Uh, we mentioned the monograph we had. I, I mean, we couldn't have 700 references with regard to Russian behavior from the Russian press if it were just Putin. It's an enormous number of, of uh, military officers, for example, who have said things that, frankly, uh, make Putin sound like a kitten. So if you personalize this to Putin and think, well, if he's gone you know, a few years from now, then everything 
uh, goes back to the benign post-Cold War order that we thought was going to happen, uh, we're going to be enormously mistaken. I would just very briefly uh, reply to, the, to, to that uh, point is that much, I think much of the argument thus far has been done by analogy to sea launch cruise missiles. Uh, and uh, air launch is, is different from that, uh, that uh, this is not a first strike weapon. And I also think that uh, Rose Gottschmiller in her interview last year uh, emphasized that the numbers of deployed LRSOs are not going to go up from what is currently deployed with outcomes. So if, if it's destabilizing, we've, we've lived with it uh, under the outcome uh, as well. But I think, again, the numbers uh, affect that too. Well, can I say two things just on that? One, one um, you know, in its day, the, the existing outcome was stealthy. You know, you weren't, you weren't going to see it coming too. In both the START Treaty and in the new START Treaty, the air launch weapons are given a stabilizing role, witness the bomber discount, you know. So we can't argue on the one hand that this administration and the Russian government recognize them as stabilizing weapons, but oh, actually they're quite destabilizing. I mean, you know, you can have one position or the other and defend it reasonably, but you can't, you can't hold both. Amen. One more. Greg. Greg Thielman, Arms Control Association. There has been considerable alarm expressed about the Russian thinking concerning the use of nuclear weapons, uh, escalate to de-escalate, uh, early first use, uh, uh, greater emphasis on nuclear over conventional. A lot of people see echoes of NATO policy in the 1960s uh, uh, in, in some of these concepts at a time when we had 7,000 tactical nuclear weapons, when the Soviets had 22 divisions right at the inner German border, uh, and when it was West Berlin that was surrounded and not Kaliningrad. Uh, I, I'd be interested in hearing you compare and contrast uh, the Russian thinking today and NATO's thinking in the 1960s about nuclear weapons. It's remarkable. This must be running around the arms control community. I got an, an email last night from Hans Christensen asking me exactly the same question. Um, so I guess I would say that it strikes me, poor benighted heathen that I am, that there is a world of difference between NATO saying it would have to escalate to the use of nuclear weapons if it were attacked in a major way and its conventional defenses were failing, that use of nuclear weapons being designed to, as I recall, the, the, um, the catechism uh, to convince the enemy it had miscalculated and to withdraw, and the Russian government saying it will use nuclear weapons to defend its unwarranted aggression to prevent NATO from defending its own soil. Now, maybe I'm wrong that there's no difference between defending your own soil and defending your aggression, but that's just me. Maybe my colleagues can help me. Well, let me suggest why I think the, the analogy is invalid. It's not true. For the analogy to actually be valid, NATO's flexible response would have had to have been the following, which it wasn't. We're going to go and take parts of the Warsaw Pact we're going to militarily occupy those parts. And if you respond conventionally, we'll engage in nuclear escalation. That was not NATO policy. That was not flexible response policy. In fact, for those of you, as I and Frank are old enough to remember it, we stayed a long way away of talking about offensive operations that we're going to take and hold territory. The Russian position is we're going to take and hold territory. And if you respond, we're going to escalate with nuclear weapons. NATO's policy was far from that. It would have had to have looked like I just said for the analogy to hold, which is why the analogy doesn't hold. I can't believe you, you equate Kaliningrad with West Berlin. I can't. Well, I, a lot of folks have hands uh, for questions, but we're going to stay on time. The federal government's shutting down, and we're going <laughs> to uh, end on time as well. We can continue this over coffee. Thank you all for coming. Yep.